Good afternoon. Welcome to the third day of Lisbon Law and Tech, the annual event offered by the Knowledge Institute of Abreu Advogados. Join this discussion and share your thoughts and ideas on social media. Yesterday, we have discussed new perspectives on Web3 and NFTs in a debate moderated by my colleague Diogo Pereira Duarte, partner with Abreu Advogados. Today's session will be on the role of the Chief Innovation Officer and the future in law firms. Bruno Oliveira, Chief Strategy Officer at Abril Advogados, will be hosting this session. Bruno, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luis. I believe today's session will be as interesting as the two previous ones. It is a pleasure for me to be the host of this third day of Lisbon Law and Tech. Today, we discuss about innovation and the path to the future in law firms with three impressive guests. Isabel Parker is an experienced and dynamic leader of legal digital transformation. She is the author of Successful Digital Transformation in Law Firms. Peter Hellhauser is the Managing Director, Legal Transformation Solutions at EPIC, the global technology enabled services leader to the legal industry. Daniel Himmel is a corporate lawyer who became a technology generalist. Daniel recently joined ClearX as a senior leader. Thank you very much to the three of you for accepting our invitation and share with us your experience and knowledge on today's topics. For all of you that are watching the online live session, feel free to ask some questions to our speakers. Can the CIO role be the path to the future in law firms? We will see this with beginning with Isabel. Please feel free, Isabel. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting us, all three of us here today for Lisbon Law and Tech. We're delighted um, to be here with you. So I think, first of all, we're just going to do a little bit about each of our respective backgrounds, because we've all come um, to the place that we are now from quite a circuitous route. So if, um, Bruno, we could have the first slide with all my pictures on it, I'll just talk to you very briefly over uh, about how I came to be where I am now. I'm it's assuming coming. you can see the slide. I can't, but I'll, I'll keep going anyway. It's so, coming. It's here. <laughs> there we Thank you. <laughs> pictures of a younger and more glamorous me. So um, I'm a finance lawyer, and I trained and I qualified at Fresh Hills for Plast which is a large international law firm. And when I reached senior associate level, um, I was asked to come out of practice to lead a, a global operating model review, looking at the services we delivered to clients, how we delivered them, and how we could work more sort of effectively and efficiently. And from there, I moved into the chief legal innovation officer role, which was a global role uh, responsible for our internal firm-wide digital transformation and for all our client-facing digital product development. And the team had you know, some success. So in 2019, we were voted the most innovative law firm in, in Europe under my tenure, and the team were rightly, I think, very proud of that. Um, I left in 2020, and I now work client side. I work for the Digital Legal Exchange, which is a not-for-profit organization working with corporate legal teams to help them with their digital transformation. So I've seen it from every single sort of angle. Um, I also consult to law firms. I've written a book about digital transformation. You can see it on the slide. So I think I've got a relatively good view of all elements of the ecosystem, um, and hopefully I can share that with you today. So that's me. Peter, can I hand over to you? Yeah, absolutely. And likewise, thanks for having us and having me. I'm really excited to talk about this topic. My background, so I've been everywhere in the legal eco ecosystem, um, have been in here for about 20 years. I started my career as a legal consultant working with law firms on cost management. Uh, and then switched over to the corporate side where again was helping them with their legal operations transformations, legal technology. And then I had somewhat of an epiphany around data and data analytics and the power of business intelligence. So spent a number of years learning that discipline, uh, worked in-house, meaning at a legal operations function for a large insurance company. Um, and then transitioned out for the last eight years, I've been in the alternative legal services space, supporting mostly corporations on legal operations and legal spend management, 
and data and business intelligence initiatives. Um, what I'm doing currently, so I am I'm at Epic and I'm originating a role called, we're calling it the head of product for legal transformation services. And so the idea behind this is number one, my background in data and data analytics, I'm helping to shape some of our business intelligence strategies. And then another key element of the role is I'm looking across our business and identifying solutions or one-off projects that we're doing that can be productized. You'll see this term used later, but where we can take a solution that maybe we've done once and we can turn it into a recurring repeatable solution that we can then package up and sell to the market. Um, so that's another big key part of what I'm doing right now. And then lastly, helping to identify new innovations and a lot of times say no, <laughs> because there's a lot of great ideas in the market um, and we have to be mindful about what we choose. And I guess last point before I hand over to Daniel, I am not a lawyer, so I've always been in, on the business side of law. So Daniel. Thanks, Peter. Um, and echoing what both of uh, Isabel and Peter had said, it's obviously a pleasure to be here and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak and, and to meet everybody and be part of this community. Um, my journey is um, a little more truncated than, than the others. Uh, I'm probably the rookie on this panel, but it's nonetheless been quite interesting. Um, similar to Isabella, I was a practicing attorney for about five years, so I'm an m and I'm a lawyer at a large firm in Canada, Toronto, where I live. Uh, but from there, I've actually taken um, kind of a turn at a bunch of different uh, sides of the aisle, we'll say, of kind of legal practice. I actually went in-house for a few years at PayPal, so doing um, kind of commercial law for, for a fintech. And then I made what has since become probably the most impactful jump of my career, moving into legal tech directly. So I actually worked for Cure Systems. For those of you that don't know, it's kind of the premier um, contract review software that leverages AI and machine learning technology. Worked there for a few years um, in a variety of different roles. That was probably my, my first and, and so far only exposure to true startup life. So I got to wear a bunch of different hats, which was super exciting because I was able to put my legal practice experience uh, to work in a variety of different roles, product, helping to build the machine learning models all the way into customer service, so working with some of the top firms in the world, Freshfields being one of them. And my current role is kind of the culmination of all of that. I, I work now for a company called ClearyX, which was only born about 10 months ago. And our focus, and I'll talk about it a bit more in, on my slides, but ClearyX is kind of an alternative legal service provider affiliated with a firm, but operating entirely separate of it. Um, maybe entirely is, is a bit misleading, but day to day we operate separate from the firm. And our mandate is to kind of reimagine legal services. So we're using a variety of different uh, tools to do that. Um, so technology being one from my experience at Kira and then actual legal practice. We do have lawyers on the team doing complex legal work. So that taps into my, my legal experience. So again, culmination of all of that and a really interesting delivery model of legal services that I think we'll start to see even more of uh, in the coming years. And I'll speak more about that in my segment. Thank you. Thank you. Isabel, please go ahead uh, with Fantastic. the presentation. Well, well, I mean, what great um, sort of backgrounds just demonstrating the sort of breadth of knowledge hopefully that you have on this panel that we can bring to bear. So look, please do ask questions. This is your time. We can talk, you know, we do a lot of talking. We can talk for as long as we need to, but we really want to make sure we're using your time effectively. So please do ask questions as, as we go along. So um, the subject of the panel is the role of the Chief Innovation Officer. And we definitely want to get into the weeds of what that role is, what it does, is it really necessary? But before we got into the specifics of the role, um, the, uh, my fellow panelists and I thought that it would be a good idea to just contextualize a little bit what we're talking about. So we're talking about innovation or digital transformation in a law firm context. So why might law firms want to innovate? What in fact is innovation or digital transformation? And what are the challenges for a law firm in affecting it? We also want to touch a little bit on the broader legal ecosystem and how that sort of plays into law firms because this is one big ecosystem, it's not just law firms alone. And we want to think a little bit about the practical application of everything you're gonna to hear today from people like Daniel who are really innovating on the ground in a law firm context. So let's do a like lawyers thing and start with a definition. <laughs> so the key question is what is innovation or digital transformation in a law firm context? I like to use the term digital transformation rather than innovation personally. Um, that's because I think digital transformation 
suggests change that is broader than legal innovation, legal tech, or legal ops. Digital transformation suggests wholesale operating model change to future proof a model. And that's very different from just innovating around the edges. The definition on the slide from Salesforce, actually, it's a really good definition, and believe me, I've, I've hunted through to find them. It says, digital transformation is the process of using digital technology to create new or improve existing business processes, culture, and customer experiences to meet changing business and market requirements. This definition hits the essentials, so it's broad enough to uh, show that digital transformation isn't just about technology, it's also about the customer experience, it's about processes, it's about culture. And it also suggests why digital transformation is so urgently needed, because in every industry sector, uh, the market is changing, the competition is changing, um, the economy is changing very, very rapidly. Digital transformation allows us to respond to that. We flip to the next slide, please, uh, Bruno. Those are all sort of big concepts, but if you want to sort of boil it down to what the application is in a law firm context, I think it's pretty simple, really. Digital transformation or innovation is just a lever for growth by enabling better service to clients. And it can look like a bunch of different things. It can look like an advisory offering. So training your lawyers on the legal and regulatory implications of digital transformation for their clients. That's, that's the advisory piece. It can be a wholly internal IT focused exercise. So um, getting with the legacy infrastructure, making sure that your uh, systems and environment is secure and stable to deliver to, to the firm and to its clients. It can be an efficiency initiative. So improving the user experience for the lawyers and for their clients and for the interface between the two uh, with, the, with the idea of sort of driving up efficiency and, and ultimately uh, driving down cost. Or it can be a transformative play, developing entirely new products and commercializing them. And Peter alluded to that and we'll come back to it. New or adjacent services that are going to delight clients, going to really differentiate the law firm in the market. So it can be all of these things, advice, efficiency, um, IT, plumbing, um, or transformation. But a really effective digital transformation is going to hit all of those. And it's going to become a real firm part of the law firm strategy. But the question is, I guess, you know, what, why should law firms innovate at all? What, why sh aren't they all doing very nicely, fancy, but making lots and lots of money? And you know, certainly Freshfields, where I used to work in Cleary, which you're affiliated to, Daniel, they are a tremendously successful businesses. But they're still innovating. They're still committed to innovation. Why, why would they bother? Well, I think the answer to that is one word. It's, it's really clients. Clients. Um, Clients' businesses are transforming very, very rapidly. There's not a client that I know of, and I'm sure Peter and Daniel have had a similar experience. Um, leading corporations are all undergoing their own digital transformations. Here on the slide, you can see KPMG did a survey of CEOs. 67% of businesses are accelerating their digital transformation. 63 are increasing budget for digital transformation. It's going to be part of the strategy for all leading corporations, and it's probably going to be the strategy for many of them. So what, you may think, what's that got to do with law firms? Well, sort of two implications. As a result of that, the mandates, the legal work that's coming to law firms now is changing. Mandates are becoming increasingly data heavy. I'm sure you see this at Epic all the time. Data heavy and global. So global investigations, um, global transactions, uh, global risk, global competition issues. And this means that clients need a combination of technical legal expertise, a given, um, along with technology-focused solutions that can handle these data-heavy, complex international global mandates. So their business is changing, the work is changing, and expectations are changing, right? Client expectations are changing. Uh, another, I'm, I'm the survey queen, I read a lot of them, and you can see here, there's, there was a Walter, Walter's Kluwer survey uh, recently just came out that said, 91% of legal departments, 91% uh, consider it important for external law firms to be leveraging technology. And by 2025, 97% will require their external law firms to sort of justify how they're using technology to, to drive up efficiency. Those are very high numbers, but not very surprising because that's already happening. Anyone that looks at an RFP will see these questions come up time and time again. So clients' expect expectations of their lawyers are changing. And they're working in different ways as well. Clients are working in different ways. They're not exempt from pressure. They're sitting there in their corporate legal teams, getting lots of pressure internally from their business clients 
to provide a more digital service, a more data-driven service, to deliver more insight at, at a lower cost. Um, and they expect their law firms to respond to that as, as they should. Most clients also have a strong diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda. What does that have to do with transformation? Well, you know, multidisciplinary teams working in an agile way requires greater diversity. Clients are doing it, law firms aren't doing it very well. There's a little bit of a mix match here. And so as clients transform and the work changes and the resource mix changes, law firms, if they want to become and remain trusted advisors, have to respond as well. Otherwise they'll become just disenfranchised in the people they serve. So that's the client bit. There's also um, new competition. Um, we, all, we all hear about the big four. The big four, I do think, are a, a, a credible threat to even law firms like Cleary or Freshfield. I mean, they've got great transformation and digital sort of um, skills. They have really deep uh, board level relationships. They could really get in there and start to make a big difference with technology. ALSPs, alternative legal service providers, uh, similarly, they, they will deliver the commoditized sort of routine parts of a mandate in a tech enabled way at a lower cost. And that, that can be, you know, that could lead to a lot of disaggregation for large law firms. Um, so that's, that's also a sort of threat and a reason to innovate. Now, those are sort of three defensive reasons. Clients are changing, work is changing, um, competition is increasing. But there's also a positive reason to innovate too. I mean, law firms need to innovate because it makes business sense. If you get it right, you can really drive up profitability through using technology uh, in, in an intelligent way, driving down your cost to deliver, delivering more efficiently, and in a fixed price mandate world, your law firm is taking all the benefit of that efficiency gain uh, for themselves or passing them on to their clients if they wish to. New revenue potential. Um, building and commercializing digital products can be a great source of revenue generation. It can bring you new clients, it can take you into new services. So there's a very positive reason to, to, um, to innovate as well. But if we flip onto the next slide, without being horribly negative, innovating in a law firm is really quite hard to do. It's challenging, it really is. And another survey here, this is the Altman Weill um, Law Firms in Transition Survey from 2021. So it's slightly outdated, but still interesting. And the quotes, you know, they sort of speak for themselves, don't they? Like law firms aren't any good at innovating, they don't want to do it. Um, you know, if they don't, if you don't start innovating now, you wait for your client to ask you, you've waited too long. All these things I think are absolutely true. It's, it is an imperative now for law firms to start to innovate and to show themselves to be responsive to their clients. I don't want this to have a negative spin, but I do think we need to be realistic because any change maker that's worked in a law firm knows that affecting change in that environment is uniquely challenging and we'll get onto the cultural elements of that in due course. So let's, that's a kind of law firm perspective and a sort of slightly macro perspective, but I think we need to broaden it out further. So can I hand over to Peter, who's gonna give us a bit more of an overview of the legal ecosystem um, collectively rather than just the law firm view, Peter. Yeah, thanks. And I, I wanna highlight a couple of things you said. So first off, the, the use of technology and the need to be more efficient. Um, on the corporate side, you, you have to think your clients are thinking or asking about could this be done all? And increasingly, as automation and new technologies come to market, they're scrutinizing bills, they're scrutinizing invoices, and they're scrutinizing the work that's being done uh, because does it need to be done in the way that it's done traditionally? So I think you hit on a really good point there. I think the other thing that may, may get lost, or I, I feel like it gets lost when, when I speak to law firms um, on behalf of corporations is you have to think about how a law department is working with their outside counsel. They could have 40, 50, 100 outside counsel. And so when they're asking you to be, uh, you know, to be more efficient or to use tools and technologies that enable business, like Isabel said, it's not because they're trying to be onerous. It's because they've got 100 unique products and platforms and tools that their 100 law firms are using. So you really have to put yourself in their shoes and, and think about where they are and how you can make things easier and better for your clients. Um, the reliance the system. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the legal eco, legal ecosystem, which we've referenced a couple of times. 
um, business person. So I love using two by two slides and this sort of tees up how I think about the legal ecosystem, the players in the market, and then where the, the market dynamics are, uh, are, are shaping the market. So if you look at the, the slide, the way we're, I'm thinking about it is work can be high value or low value and work can be high complexity and low complexity. So just to orient you, everything in the upper right is high value and high complexity, everything in the lower left, low value, low complexity, and then those two other rectangles are some combination of high value, low complexity or low value, high complexity. Um, and if I had drawn this slide 10, 15 years ago, the way it would look would be the upper right quadrant would be law firms. The lower left quadrant would be legal process outsourcing companies, which was kind of like the version 1.0 of alternative legal service providers. That's where you shifted your, your low value work. And then those other two quadrants would be probably actually law firms um, because law departments were not as large as they are today. And so there wasn't as much work that could be done in a corporation. And so um, the dynamics of the market, the ecosystem are changing now where you see the new evolution, legal process outsourcing companies have evolved into alternative legal service providers like, uh, like Epic, like my company. Uh, we are doing more and different things and we're doing more and more advanced services. We've become domain experts in certain areas where we have industrialized uh, legal service work. So we are increasingly pushing into higher value and higher complexity work where we're allowed to. Um, and certainly in the US that's different than in EMEA. Um, we ourselves, I think, are seeing threats from automation. So 15 years ago, if you had a litigation where you collected 10,000 documents, you were reviewing 10,000 documents. And with today's tools and technologies, you're finding ways to, to shrink that population of documents down to 3,000 documents. That has a material business effect on alternative legal service providers. Um, and so we can either resist that or we can lean into it and become experts in automation and shape our solutions to, to fit that new reality. Um, that big swath in the middle of, of white. So I think that's an under talked about feature of the ecosystem today is law, depart law departments, corporate law departments have really grown in size over the last years, many years. Um, and so what they're doing is they're thinking about where can I take, where can I bring more valuable work in-house because it's a strategic, it's strategic and strategically important to me. Um, so how do I retain that work in-house? How do I engage ALSPs for more and more work? And, and then as Isabel said, there's new entrants like flexible legal talent is another solution that law departments are looking at. And then the big four, I think, are going to have a place in that space as well. So when you're uh, when you're looking at this from a law firm and you're saying, well, how do I fit in this ecosystem? You, you want to retain that high value work. Um, and then you also want to think about ways to to manage and push back into some of these other areas that you may no longer be servicing and you or you or you have a, a domain expertise and you want to operationalize it and service it more um i think that's why we're seeing in many law firms i think certainly cleary is a, is a great example of the of thinking about the services and solutions that you're doing making investments in legal operations or innovation where you can take some of the learnings from all the alternative legal services market and even some of the big four and flexible legal talent and devise solutions that can bring you back into more of this, uh, more of the ecosystem. Um, Isabel, can I pass that back to you? Sure. Thanks very much, Peter. Absolutely right. And I, I love that. I love the two by two. It's a, it's a very useful. I might be stealing that for some of my presentations in the future. So, so we've talked a little bit uh, at a high level about what innovation digital transformation means. We've talked about the law firm view. We've talked about the legal ecosystem more broadly. I think let's kind of bring it now into more practical realities. You know, it's easy to talk about digital transformation um, in very generalized terms. What do you actually do if you're in a law firm now, you're listening to this uh, webinar and you think, yeah, I just want to get started. So 
when I was writing my book on uh, digital transformation in law firms, I did a lot of research um, both within the legal ecosystem and without, and I did find it was quite difficult to, because of the maturity or lack of maturity of the legal market at the time to find many examples of really successful um, digital transformations within law firms themselves. There are pockets of it and there were some very successful law firms, but there wasn't very many um, sort of end-to-end -end success stories. So I did a lot of research outside the legal industry to look at what really successful digital companies, not necessarily digital natives, incumbents too, do to drive um, digital success, if you like. And I've boiled it down to these five factors. There are probably millions of more we could debate it back and forth, but here's a starter for 10 for us all, just to think about how we could affect this in legal. So really digitally effective companies are uh, customer-centric. So they think about the customer, the client needs and client experience before everything else. You think of Amazons of this world, they're very customer focused, of course. Um, they are also very strategic. So they treat digital transformation or innovation as a strategic play, not just a sort of project or a program or a series of little tech investments, it's part of the strategy. And that's a really important differentiator. Um, they show commitment. They commit to the digital transformation even when it gets hard. And I'm sure both of you have all stories about when it does get hard because um, there's a there's, the, the figure banded around that 70% of digital transformations fail. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I know that it's a hard road and things do go wrong. Um, and you're, when you're winning prizes and awards, everybody loves you, but then things start to go wrong and people don't and you sit down the agenda. So I mean, commitment of money, it doesn't have to be a lot, you do need some room fenced and leadership time. Um, the fourth sort of uh, critical factor, if you like, is people. So really successful digital companies hire the best, the right people to drive the change forward. And in a legal context, that doesn't mean the best technical lawyers anymore. And we'll get onto, I think, skill sets and how they're evolving um, later in the presentation. But you need the right people with the right mindsets and the right mix of resources to drive uh, the transformation through. And certainly the lawyer, non-lawyer thing is a big issue here. You know, we should not be using that terminology um, you know, people who aren't, don't have a legal background have, you know, just as much to bring, absolutely an essential part of the mix to transforming within a law firm context. And finally, the cultural thing, you know, really successful digital companies have a culture in which um, you can sustain uh, innovation and allow it to flourish. Now, okay, these are all examples of best practice, whatever that really means. And, you know, you can't just pick them up and shove them into a law firm context, because frankly, lots of these things are not going to land very easily. So we have to think about them in a more nuanced way. What changes might we need to make to our models, our law firm models and structures, or the way we organise or the resource mix we have to start to drive these kind of best practices? And I think um, Daniel is going to take us through a sense of, you know, what do you have to do to the model to make it different? I and mean, they've got a very interesting model at Cleary. It's good to hear about that and your, and your sort of broader... Um, view on, on models in general within law firms. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Isabel, and thank you, Peter. Um, I'm sure it was intentional, but I think uh, my section builds quite nicely on both of their um, both of their presentations. So it's actually in my in my eyes, kind of giving a, a face to the name of a lot of what we talked about, giving you a practical example of how we've kind of, as ClearyX, evaluated the market and, and come to our identity as an alternative legal service provider. And what are the things that we notice about the traditional legal model that were potentially a challenge for us and how we're trying to kind of circumvent that in a creative way um, to bring that kind of innovation to bear at the firm. So I think what, what, what I'm gonna to try to do is answer the question of how you can create new models of legal service within a law firm given all the constraints that we've spoken about and, and <laughs> to kind of give you the, the answer uh, right at the outset, for us at least, we're building it outside of a traditional law firm. I think that's, we've made the determination that that's the best way to achieve what we'd like to achieve. Um, and I'll walk you through why it is why it is the case. So if you can move to the next slide. So again, this touches on a lot of uh, the items that Isabel spoke about, but um, innovationally, in our eyes, at least, innovation typically sits at the intersection of a variety of different legal functions within a firm. Uh, you've got an innovation committee, IT, ALSPs, um, other competitors, you've got HR and so on. Um, you often run up against many roadblocks um, and competing interests, right? IT, for instance, might have a vision or certain limitations for innovation that it might conflict with firm leadership, which usually has um, quite ambitious plans and IT usually likes to rein that in, or perhaps it's, it's the knowledge management team or HR. So you've got competing interests when you're sitting kind of in that, in that intersection. And if you wanna be successful within a firm, you have to know your identity from the outset 
and stick to it. Um, that's tough though, because you've got, again, got those competing interests that often, you, often require you to shape shift to get things done. So it can be really hard. You need support from all of these functions, but to varying degrees. An example of that, for instance, would be KM may want you, so knowledge management may want you to um, support their practice know-how, uh, but you want to steer away from some of that legacy, those legacy habits, because legal innovation in your eyes needs to be a wholesale change, right? So if you're working with them, you don't want to necessarily undermine kind of their, their mandate, but you also want to be able to think beyond it. So again, these are just a few examples. There's always going to be challenges when you're managing all these overlapping priorities, especially when um, those different functions change sometimes independent of you, right? These different functions might have leadership changes. Uh, and that leadership might ultimately have a different mandate for how that team interacts with you. So there's a whole host of things that kind of happen beyond your control that you have to spend quite a bit of time navigating in order to just kind of execute your basic vision. Um, if we just move to the next slide. So that's the complex web of stakeholders, which, which makes it a challenge in the firm sometimes to affect that vision. Um, but you also run up against kind of standard constraints in big law. And I think Isabel touched on some of these. Um, many of these have been, many of these firms have been practicing within the same structure, essentially, <laughs> for 50 plus years. So it's a, it's a difficult uh, kind of rock to move. I've noticed here, I've noted here a number of the typical constraints, but I'll highlight just a few. Um, it might be sound trite, but telling rich people that their business model is broken um, is difficult. You're convincing people to change a practice that has been hugely successful and profitable for years, and that's really hard. Uh, you can get minor tweaks and you can do some innovation theater where it looks like you're making big change, but wholesale change might not be good for the firm in the eyes of these practice practitioners, whether it's partners or, or um, kind of executives. Sometimes it takes a long-term vision that won't really bear fruit early on. And that's hard for people when profit in the short term is kind of the driving force. And that's not unique to law firms. It's the case for most, most businesses with kind of a focus on the bottom line. The incentive structure is ultimately not super conducive to, to the innovation, the long-term kind of innovation vision. The tech adoption piece, so number four, that goes back to the innovation theater piece. Buying tools is one thing, and um, successful adoption is another. So that's a challenge that we have within law firms is you'll have uh, departments that procure a certain technology and that technology gives the veneer of innovation, but buying it and using it are very different things. It takes manpower and willpower to use technology. So you actually need people who are gonna use the technology and you need to be determined to use it. And that again is a long-term vision. This is from my experience working at Kira. So I'm trying to convince people every day to use my technology. Um, and you need that persistence and that willpower because you don't get the tool right away. There's the, These tools are fantastic and they do some amazing things, but it takes time to get comfortable with them. So you need a firm that's committed to, again, long-term vision. You're, pick up on a running theme here. It's a long-term vision and a willingness to provide that runway to, to build the kind of innovation structure that you want. And the last piece that I think is relevant is the, take, the home team associate component. And I think there are other elements that are probably uh, bigger hurdles to innovation within firms. But for me, this is kind of near and dear because I witnessed it firsthand at the firm. I witnessed it firsthand when trying to sell into firms. Typically, the people running innovation are homegrown talent. So they're individuals that grew up at the firm. And as you know, as, as lawyers or soon to be lawyers, you often stick with the same firm for your career um, or that firm was maybe your first job out of university. So you don't know any other kind of business structure. You don't know how services can be delivered in different ways. And so when you're asking those individuals to innovate, it's minor tweaks. Um, it's, and even at scale, it really isn't material. So you need fresh eyes to see what works and what doesn't. Um, and that leads me to kind of, <laughs> uh, kind of a cheap analogy, but to us, this is kind of uh, encapsulates our decision to ultimately build Cleary X. So we, we looked at it as you had the option to fix the factory of the firm or elements of the factory. So go in and swap out a machine or, take a particular product line and swap it out, but ultimately you're still going to exist within that, that factory, that factory that has quite a bit of legacy practices within it. And where if you tweak one thing, there's a trickle down effect upstream and downstream that can be a challenge. And you've got a lot of people that need to buy into making that change because it's going to impact their day to day. The alternative is you just 
build a new factory. <laughs> it sounds super easy uh, and it's not, um, but at least in that case, and our factory is gonna look quite a bit different than the traditional factory. It's not gonna be as big and, and not as expensive, hopefully, um, but it's going to be built in our image, right? We're gonna, we have an idea. Um, we know what the constraints should be. We know what kind of um, structures we need in place, incentive structures more specifically, what type of um, uh, corporate structure, what type of, um, uh, a whole host of, and I'm gonna get, I just don't wanna kind of uh, spoil the next slide, but ultimately there's a whole host of things that we, we know are the previous slide, sorry, uh, that are super important to a successful innovative structure. And ultimately we have to do that. Um, we have to build it on our own to get there. And so that's the genesis of Cleary X. Uh, we're an experimental platform. We're separate from the firm. So that's building the new factory. We're designed to kind of reimagine legal services. Um, it sounds a, a bit cliche, but we we envision doing that in an actual kind of tangible on the ground way. And that's through people. So we, we have a team of 14 uh, staff at the moment planning to scale uh, significantly from there. Uh, these are highly trained people. They're fully remote. Uh, they're not Cleary alums. That goes to the home team um, kind of bias that I spoke to earlier. And we have a variety of different roles. And again, building the new factory. It's not just um, the different kind of experts that know how to build the one machine. We've got people that know how to build a variety of different tools within that machine. So we've got our, pro our project managers. We have our technology experts. We have our lawyers. Of course, we are a legal services provider, um, but we believe that there is value for uh, value kind of glean from having a bunch of different perspectives. Then there's the process piece. So we have project management discipline, which sometimes is missing from firms. So we're applying these universal approaches to our matters. And we're never, we're hoping to never do the same thing twice. If we see in a couple deals that there's a very similar structure, we're going to automate it. Um, and I think that's an attitude that sometimes is, is, is missing from the firm. And then there's the technology piece, which is probably the most important. So we have AI tools that we use. Uh, we have other document automation tools, and we're hoping to build some of our own. So you'll see on the right-hand side, some examples of some of the portals that we're building. And all of this is, we've kind of been given the leeway to build these types of things that I think and again, I might be kind of shortchanging the firms, but I don't believe we would have had the runway to do this type of stuff because it is a lot of testing and iterating and not necessarily profitable at first. And I think the, to have kind of the, the long-term vision, again, going back to that same theme is super important because you don't get the runway to do the creative things that you need to do um, unless you have that vision. Um, our plan ultimately is to turn all of this into a machine, <laughs> again, to that, that that uh, factory analogy, but that offers high quality, lower cost legal services to firm clients and to our own clients. And we wanna be data-driven, that's kind of a running theme. Um, obviously, Peter touched on it quite a bit, but we wanna have analytics and transpa transparency about our fees, turn times, we want people to know how quickly it, we can get the work done. Uh, we wanna have review metrics and we wanna always uh, ensure that we have kind of high quality. And the most important piece to us is that we wanna have creative, uh, and I know, um, at least not in North America, but in in uh, Europe and the UK, alternative fee arrangements are quite common. They're not really in the US and what we can do is provide that. And I think that's where the market is shifting. So we're gonna be able to uh, kind of take advantage of the margin opportunity there. Um, a lot of this is experimentation though. That's the X in our name. Um, and I think it's possible because we operate separate from the firm. Again, going back to it, I think that's the fundamental uh, trait that, that kind of we benefit from is that we don't have the constraints of the firm. Um, we're able to try new things outside of that traditional structure that allow us to kind of execute on some of these kind of big picture visions. And to tie it back to Isabel's earlier slide, I think a lot of what we're doing and uh, touch, touches on customer centricity, strategy, we're not looking at kind of a piecemeal solution. We have a vision, a, a short-term and long-term vision. Uh, commitment, we are committed and leadership is committed to seeing this through. People, I mentioned earlier, we're, we hire a very particular type of person um, with an innovation bend and, um, and with uh, a kind of a specific skill set. And then culture, we are very focused on culture. I know law firms are, but I think for us, um, our model only works when people love where they work because we can't compete with law firms in terms of salary uh, and prestige, we'll say, but we can compete in terms of um, how interesting it is, uh, the work that we do um, and the culture that we build. Uh, if you just go to the next slide and this will be, oh, there is no next slide. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Um, um, 
if you're successful at building the outside that alternative model that I've been speaking about um, outside of the firm, if you can do it with a strong connection to the brand though, I think that's kind of the best scenario. You can accomplish pretty great things. So just a few of the items here, um, you get a stable of existing clients, that halo effect. So you get access to top tier work. So all of this is to say, we're able to do what we're doing because we're separate from the firm. But I, I don't think we would be successful if we were entirely separate. Like we are separate in how we operate day to day, but we have an association with the firm and access to the firm expertise. And I think that's very important for us to execute on our vision. We need to have access to that top tier work and be able to collaborate with some of the expertise of the firm and, and their clients to test our model. The adoption challenges being outside of the firm, but connected allows us to wrap our services uh, wrap services around our products. So the builders at Cleary X are actually the users. And so we don't have that adoption issue I was talking about earlier, but we still can push innovation back into the firm. And the last one is building data models from scratch so that we can capture uh, meaningful info. The key to innovation is knowing what worked and didn't work on a granular level. It allows for that constant improvement. And that's the attitude that we have. We want to be able to build better products and client services because we know from deal to deal what worked and what didn't. Ultimately, it's a terrible saying, but there are more than one ways to skin a cat. Um, and certainly there are some challenges to our model. Um, I'm not sitting here saying that it is the only model that works, but at Cleary X, we found it to be the one that allows us to do the things we've set out to do. Um, to be determined if we can get there, it's only been 10 months, uh, but we, our prediction is that we will, and this will be a viable alternative delivery model that has already been successful for some, but we'll, we'll start to see uh, pop up more frequently as hopefully we become one of the many success stories. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, we have prepared some common questions that uh, maybe the audience has. Uh, I don't know who wants to, 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 to clarify a little bit, but uh, what about coding? Is it, uh, do lawyers need to, to code to be innovative? I can answer, I'd say no. <laughs> as a, Short answer is no. I think we've talked about just broadly about some of the tools in the market that are no code, low code kinds of solutions that help you be more efficient. And I think a lot of solutions are on top of those. And certainly the Microsoft ecosystem is advancing exponentially as well. So there's ways that you can use these tools to be more efficient um, to deliver your own services without needing to know how to code. Yeah, I'd agree with that, Peter. I think if there's one skill um, sort of allied to coding, but not coding, that I think lawyers already have, but maybe it's sort of underused a bit, it's sort of mapping out logic. So thinking about the logic of what you do or the process of what you do, because we were never really trained in that. Well, I certainly wasn't growing up as a lawyer, but that's so important for developers to use that logic to develop, you know, um, the solutions. And so to start to think of what you do as blocks of activity rather than sort of a big miasma of you know bespoke brilliance, that's that's the skill that really I'd, I'd like to see lawyers use more or develop more. Like an yeah, engineer I, mindset, no? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, I was just I, I agree. Um, I don't think it's necessary. That being said, it could be a differentiator, especially in. Um, alternative legal service providers like us, for instance, like we don't need it, but I think as um, entities like us start to uh, pop up a little bit more, there might be roles within the organization that could benefit from coding. So if you're able to marry the two, I think that could be a differentiator, but I don't think it would preclude you from entry into any of kind of these innovation roles. But to Isabel's point, I totally agree with the, the mapping piece. Um, Project management specifically, I think, is a skill that sometimes it's kind of undersold because it's viewed as maybe beneath lawyers, but I think it, it can be a differentiator, absolutely. A lot of what we do as lawyers is manage projects. And then I think there's design thinking, um, which is a, kind of a new discipline, but I've now seen it crop up a, a few times where you're kind of thinking about the, the design of the delivery of a service. And I think that discipline um, will become increasingly more relevant. Okay. Uh, something like, uh, is it innovation only for a small team in the law firm or it is something more transversal? Isabel, can you say something about that? 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's really interesting, Daniel, listening to what you're doing at Cleary, and I've got such a ton of questions I want to ask you anyway. But <laughs> the, the way we approach it within, I definitely will, the way we approach it in Freshfields is we did have much more of an entrepreneur model, which meant that we took, you know, home team associates and we, we um, seconded them into my innovation team, all of which aligned into actually our IT, global technology department. So it was a very much inside, um, an inside job, if you like, which definitely had its challenges. Um, I sort of tend to believe that if you're really going to embed change, proper digital transformation, wholesale operating model transformation, and new ways of thinking and a new mindset and culture, um, you do need to engage the sort of diverse many rather than a sort of elite few or even just a, a separate entity, although I utterly understand why you've done that and I can see the benefits as you portrayed them. Um, I, I, I would like to see practicing lawyers um, take responsibility for developing solutions. I think they're the closest to the clients. I think they're the closest to the work. They're the closest to the pain points. That said, it's very, very difficult for them to find the time to do it. And there was another survey on the survey queen by a company that was Thomson Reuters, it might have been, where they set out um, a sort of a two by two matrix of, um, you know, things lawyers like doing and their busyness. And what the busier they got, the more innovation, new ways of working, KM, all fell below the radar. People just didn't want to do it because they wanted to focus on their client work. And people in, in big law firms like Cleary and Freshfields are very, very busy people. So personally, I think the answer, the really long-term answer is to engage the diverse many in the law firm, including practicing lawyers as much as you possibly can through a product ownership structure. That's what we did at Freshfields. Um, but I recognize that that comes with significant challenges. So I see the reason why Daniel, you took the, the path that you did at Cleary. Yeah, yeah I, I, it touches on a lot of what I mentioned earlier. I, I agree with what Isabel. I think part of why we chose, we, we believe in the model, but it's also a product of the firms kind of identifying their own weaknesses, right? Certain firms uh, may, maybe have the culture or the, um, they, they have kind of the it kind of embedded mentality of, of change and innovation and, and it works better at certain firms. For us, I think our firm recognized that it they weren't one of those and credit to them for, for acknowledging it and that this would be the only model that would work. But I totally agree with Isabel. If you if you're have kind of a sober analysis of your firm's willingness to, to adopt this type of change, if they're there, I, I think the inside models absolutely can work. Okay. Uh, Peter, do you think that clients really care about innovation or is that the service and they don't care? The, do you think that the, the reduction of cost it will bring also innovation to the to the sector? What do you think about this? So clients obviously definitely care about innovation. And I think I said earlier the the notion of does this work need to be done? So and I use it in a very narrow sense of the law firm is submitting a bill for work and it contains work that should be automated or shouldn't be billed anymore. So they're expecting that law firm to, in that sense, be innovative and deliver work that they're no longer paying for. But I also think you, you could extend this out to what the law firm should be doing for their clients, which is preventing work from happening, preventing legal work from happening. So how do you innovate so that you're preventing work? or you're helping that client to um, move higher up the chain to, to, uh, to assess risk. Um, there's solutions out there that I don't think are being presented to our clients or to your clients today that I think could help them deflect a lot of work um, or automate a lot of work. And I think something that, that Daniel touched on also is um, the, the, so the technical legal advice. I think if you aren't standardizing and processifying work, then you run the risk of giving different advice at different times and clients notice that. So to be able to have um, a consistent knowledge management solution where you're constantly drawing on those insights in a systematized way that gives clients comfort. Um, they're, really, like, they're really about no surprises on the corporate side. And so if you can help them solve that without, uh, with, you know, process and innovation, then you're really helping your clients. Uh, I agree. And I'd, I'd add to that, that um, 
Peter, when you were talking about your legal ecosystem, you mentioned that lots of corporate legal teams are uh, innovating themselves, and, and so they are. And I have to say, when I was in role at Freshfield, I didn't really have a sense of, of how very sophisticated corporate legal teams are even beginning to um, white label their own know-how and sell it as products into the market. This is happening now, particularly in Europe and particularly in the financial services sector. And I think as as technology develops, as you know, as as markets become tighter and costs become higher, and corporate legal teams are forced to do more with less, as we constantly hear, they'll start to use and leverage technology and their own resources and their own solutions to disaggregate lawyers completely. So I think not only do clients care about innovation, I think they're doing it. They're doing it, and I would be really putting them with the big four and the LSPs as people to watch because they could start to disaggregate the law firm entirely. So yeah, I think they care deeply about innovation. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, do you think that, I think we, we already answered to this, but uh, many of us think that innovation is only about uh, software. I think you're, uh, again, Isabel, I think you bring uh, something that I, I, I think that is more important than uh, software, a specific software that we are building. Um, but I think cultural, th the cultural part of a uh, law firm and uh, in a big law firm like uh, like you were in in Freshfields, I think it's more important than a software or an application. No, what do you think about that? Yeah, I do. I do think that obviously, um, true innovation, true digital transformation is much broader than technology. If you just buy technology, that's not a transformation. It's just buying stuff. And uh, and to, to Daniel's point, there's a lot of shelfware. People don't adopt it. Um, so so that in itself isn't isn't um, innovation or digital transformation, but obviously technology is a very important part of um, automating um, and making more efficient in developing new products to commercialize in the market. So it, you know, we can't underestimate its important to, importance too, and the importance of being um, both leveraging technology for the benefit of clients and understanding how clients themselves are um, digitally transforming and being able to advise on, on those elements from a from an um, advisory perspective as well. And I think, um, it's important in any innovation team or any digital transformation that any technology investment, this is just what I would think, needs to be aligned into one global um, technology leadership. I would be, I would feel uncomfortable, Daniel, with a model where um, there was sort of uh, investment in technology that doesn't fit the broader strategy of the technology investment of the broader firm. I would find that so it's a worry. We had a, we had a bit of a parallel run at one point at Freshfields where we had a an IT team, IT team and a separate innovation team. And when we um, brought the innovation team into global technology, it was a much more effective, um, much more effective uh, sort of body. We, so we did our sort of stabilize our plumbing work, our modernized work, which is our sort of user uh, experience work and our transformation work all under one roof, under one ultimate leader. And that was a very effective way for us to run faster. So I think, you know, global technology and technology is a very, very important part of the puzzle. It shouldn't be underestimated either. Yeah, I think to so this industry, I, I think more than other industries is less about software, it's more about software enablement. So yeah, software enabled services, meaning you have tech that's underpinning the services, but then you have a service wrapper that's delivering those services. Um, because I, I just think that that's how most tech is being consumed in this industry today. Thank yeah, you. just to bring a full circle, I, I totally agree. Um, having been on, on kind of the tech sales side, that was always the missing element. Um, you could provide as much customer service as possible, but ultimately you're giving them the tool to use. And, and again, we run into the adoption issue, we run into the know-how issue. It's that service wrapper that's huge. And I think that's, again, the reason why we formulated the, the structure that we have, where we're going to use the technology, but add that service component um, so it's it's technology underpinning service, and I think it's my belief after now four or five years in the industry on both sides that that is that is what the client ultimately wants. If we can get to the space where the, the technology is so advanced that perhaps the service piece isn't as needed or it's embedded somehow, that would be great. At the present moment, I haven't seen a tool, at least like the kind of the linchpin tools of, of, of legal tech that can be properly utilized without a service component. So I absolutely think that that's the, the most effective delivery mode. Thank you. Uh, we are getting closer to the end of this session, but before that, we will have time to one or, or more uh, questions. Um, we have one question from our audience. Um, we are discussing in this right moment in Portugal, the liberalization of legal services 
the multidisciplinary, uh, the entrance of big four in the in the legal services. Um, with this, sh with changes in the regulation being considered, it is necessary to innovate in legal service and to access to justice to justice from the public. Do you think that this liberalisation will be better for the the client side? Who wants to to answer first? No one. No one wants to take that one. <laughs> <laughs> the U.S. is is behind. I think. I mean, uh, on, on some of these issues. So I, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to, how it's being rolled out in EMEA. In the US, I think there is just a small pocket of, like there's a couple states that allow, um, what is it, legal services to be delivered by, or law to be delivered by a non-law firm, which is a op cracking open the door to where I think probably the big four is looking at, because um, if they're, they have large, essentially large law firms globally that if they if the regulation continues continues to change to change in the US, then they're going to be positioned to be essentially a global law firm. Um, I don't know how that's different in, in EMEA, though. Yeah, in the UK, uh, the big four, for example, can provide legal services to an alternative business structure. So that so it, it is it is permitted. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why um, the big four is really, as I said before, a very credible threat to, um, to law firms. I mean, they're, they're not there yet. They're building very fast. They don't yet have the, um, the, the, the legal uh, advisory capability, understandably, that the, the big uh, law firms do. But I think that deep transformation ex experience, digital experience, and the relationships that the big four have, you know, at board level, business level, that's, that's scary for, for big law firms and that they really definitely are, are ones to watch. Thank you. Um, we have another question for, for Isabel, sorry. Um, do, what do you think that it's the main challenge uh, or it would be the first step to, to develop a culture that fosters innovation in the law firm? What would be the first advice that you can bring to the table? Um, the first thing I would do is focus on strategy. Um, just as sort of Daniel has said, it's really important to have a long-term vision and strategy for um, digital transformation or innovation. Um, thinking about the client benefit, thinking about the benefits of the firm. And I would say um, setting out that strategy, it doesn't have to be huge, great tone, but setting it out clearly, communicating it clearly, and having a business case that supports it, that sets out the costs of your investment, the total cost of ownership of your investment, including change management and adoption, plus the benefits and really quantifying those benefits. What's the efficiency gain? What new clients will you win? Uh, what new revenues will you generate? What, which adjacent services will you go into? And setting them out and tracking the benefits religiously, that builds credibility. That will start to change the mind of even the most conservative lawyers, I think. Okay, thank you. Good answer. Peter, <laughs> uh, how that uh, analytics can also bring innovation? How how you think about that? So data analytics in general, I think, can bring a lot of innovation. Some of the things that Daniel mentioned around um, understanding cycle times, how long some work takes, so you can better understand and predict the work that's being done. Um, I think those are areas that are just the, the surface is just being scratched in this industry. Um, I spend a lot of time in spend management and spend analytics. I mentioned earlier that one of your clients are asking, should this work have been done at all? They're also asking, um, should it be done by a law firm? There's many other solutions in the ecosystem. And so being able to use data to prove out, um, yes, it should be, or you know, no, it shouldn't be, and we're being proactive about how it should be done, um, I think that's really valuable. I think in the US, again, we haven't done a lot with, with alternative fees. We're still kind of we're still building out up fixed fees. I know that's different outside the US, but like Isabel said, you can really drive your profitability as a law firm. And that's something that's like mind boggling for me is that fixed fees benefit the seller more than the buyer. And yet law firms are resistant to it on the, on the, in the US to be able to say, how much time did it take me to do something? And if I can repeat that, uh, and I can deliver it at a packaged price, then the client's going to be happy and I'm going to be able to manage my efficiency and, and improve my profitability. So it's win-win for both. Um, again, I think law firms need to be doing more of that. And it's weird because the corporate side is doing that spend analysis for them. Um, but then what they're doing is they're trying to hack down the costs because yeah. they're the corporate side. <laughs> 
Thank you. Uh, just one last question for uh, also for Daniel. Um, Daniel, can you share uh, the percentage of Cleary gross revenue uh, invested in Cleary X? Uh, short answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> I can't share it. Uh, but I will tell you that um, it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about a, a long-term runway. And I think that's the, the key to us having success is that there isn't a vision that we're going to be hugely profitable at first. I think to be totally honest, we've done quite well over the, over the first six to eight months of, of the business. But the vision is that this is a long-term investment. Um, and I don't think we're going to be have our feet held to the fire because I think we've articulated, to Isabel's point, the strategy, the long-term strategy. And there's an understanding that we need that runway to build the products, to build, to further refine our strategy until we, to, before we can start kind of discussing mm -hmm. profitability. And I think that's the only way that we'll, we will be successful. Mm -hmm. But this mo model of legal tech incubators, I think, is just going to grow more, assuming that those, that type of runway is given. And it can be replicated in other law firms. You think that? That should be that, like clear. I, I think so. I, I think it's again. I don't want to take up too much time because we're, we're near the end. But um, I think it was a perfect storm, just given the, the firm's kind of general uh, historical apprehension to innovation, that they understood that this had to happen outside of the firm. So I think there are instances, Isabel's point about Freshfields, where they were able to be hugely successful within the confines of a traditional firm. So I, I think it needs to be. There might be a business case why actually just in terms of, of profitability that doing it outside might be better. But at the moment, I think you just have to take stock of kind of the state of innovation within the firm, the different um, stakeholders and, and kind of supporters that you have and the, the structure that's going to enable you to do what you need to do. If it's there, go do it. If not, I think you should not do it. You should just find an alternative, which is what we've, we've done with ClearyX. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Unfortunately, we run out of the uh, time for this session. I would like to thank our guests, Daniel, Isabel and Peter, for your time and important contribution brought to, to this debate. Also, many thanks to those who attended online. Feel free to write us, either on Abreu Advogados website or in our social network. And please, follow Lisbon Law and Text next sessions. Tomorrow, we will be the last, it will be the last day of this edition and we will talk about going digital and the future of justice with the participation of Portuguese Minister of Justice, Caterina Sarmenti Castro. Have a great day. Thank you. See you.